I am Weird Willis, James A. Willis, and we discussed primarily Weird Ohio, but we also dabbled in Central Ohio Legends and Lore, Southern Ohio Legends and Lore, and Ohio's Historic Haunts. Okay. So how do you research a book like Weird Ohio? It's interesting because I always start with, I've got like a short list where people will say, you know, you need to check this out or check this out. And then I will start doing research. Inevitably, when I start with that research, it leads me down another path where I start to find other weird things that are going along with it. But how do you find something like a homemade roller coaster? That is actually a friend of a friend where they say like, hey, you need to go and check this out. I heard that this guy builds this and you start going down the road and all of a sudden you're like, it is there. People often ask me, they say, well, how do you ride it? Do you have to pay? And I'm like, no, you just go knock on his door and if he's, he's home, you get to ride it. You have to sign a waiver after you ride it. So I'm not really sure how that worked, but after, after, but you, I did, yeah, after you ride it, you have to, to sign it. But that, the, the waiver thing was actually a book that people signed. And within it, they were all, people were coming from all over the world. Do you have a favorite Weird Ohio site in the book? I have a soft spot for the wall of gum, simply because there's, it doesn't seem like that would exist. It's not a wall, it's a building that's just covered completely with wads of gum that um, the community comes from miles around to leave their mark in the form of a wad of chewed up gum. <laughs> okay, now let, let's, let's give a little context okay. to that comment. Yeah. Now, some things like the world's largest cuckoo clock are designed to be points of interest. Yes. How do you end up with a wall of gum? I think, it, well, I think it starts with a wall of gum. So a lot of people are, are familiar with the idea of like a, an amusement parks or like bank drive throughs where you find a couple of pieces of gum. I think it just got way out of hand at this restaurant and they started just sticking it all over and for whatever reason, something clicked where they said, maybe we should embrace it. Because as I said in the presentation, you can buy wall of gum t-shirts and coffee mugs, so they embrace it. Now the whole idea of how hygienic that is at a restaurant, I, I'm not one to well, I, I, I am curious what the health officer thinks. They're walking in, they're like, oh, it's bigger than last time. I, I am too, and it, it, it really is that it is, it's not just that one wall, it's all the way around. It's the drive-up window uh, in the drive through is covered with it. So I, 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 I think maybe they just got to the point where they were like, we can't clean it off anymore, so we'll just, we'll just roll with it. So how about a signed hot dog bun? How, does, how do we end up having a place in Ohio where you can find signed hot dog buns? That, I found out about that, it was just a little blurb. It was an article about actor Jamie Farr and his connection to Toledo. And that's when it was brought up that he sort of ad-libbed some of the Toledo sort of landmarks in the MASH TV show because his character was supposedly from Toledo, and they, it was just a tiny line at the bottom that said that after the show ended, that he went there and they asked him to sign a hot dog bun, and I was like, wait, what? And again, it was just a one little line in there, and I kind of latched onto that and then started doing research and found, yeah, it was a real hot dog bun. They'd since made him go and sign a plastic one, and now that's become a thing. I do need to reach out to them and see if I rank, actually, since I've been talking about it for decades, if I rank, a signed hot dog bun at, at Tony Paco's, but we'll see. What do you need to do to be bun worthy? I do, <laughs> I do not know. I so said, you've been working so long. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, maybe I need to just go in there and, and query that, you know, am I bun worthy? I don't think I've ever said that before. So maybe, you know, we'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> you've written a lot of books about historic haunts and local legends and lore. While researching those books, did you stumble on any of the items and you stashed away like, okay, well, that's not haunting, but that's still incredible. I can't wait to write about that one later. Oh, sure, yeah. That goes back to the whole idea that when I, I get an idea, other ones sort of pop out. It's why I've ended up that right now I'm working on four different books because exactly that. It's like, well, that's not really haunted, but it is weird, so maybe that goes here. And this is more historical, so this will go over this way. So, yeah, it's, it's there is never a lack of weird, historical, ghostly, urban legend sort of things in a state like Ohio. I mentioned it in the presentation, it's fascinating to me that Ohio really embraces 
its weird side. And they are very open to the idea that folklore can still be considered part of history, even if it's not that you're validating, say the ghost is real, or validating that, yes, these events really did happen there. But you have the idea that usually teenagers are going on these legend trips to these locations and they are having experiences that they keep with them their entire life. That was like, no, I didn't see a ghost, but it was really cool. King Arthur doesn't have to be a real person for the myth to have real meaning. Exactly, exactly. Hey, so I'm guessing that writing a book like Weird Ohio leads a lot of people saying to you, for the next one, you got to go to dot, dot, dot. Yes. So is there a sequel forthcoming? There is not a, a sequel for Weird Ohio in title, but there is a sequel in the works for a Weird Ohio type book. A Weird Ohio in spirit. There you go. There you go. Oh, I like that. It's yours. Okay. So you are also a paranormal investigator in addition to being an author. Correct. Yes. Could you please define paranormal investigator? I kind of actually say that I'm more of a paranormal researcher because for me, I, and I, I think it's one of the main reasons where I don't, I don't get invited to many of these like paranormal conventions because I sort of walk a very fine line in that I do believe in ghosts. So I say I do believe in spooks, I do, I do. But I do believe in ghosts, but I also openly admit I don't know what they are. I don't know how they do the things they do. And where I kind of get into trouble is I say, I don't think anybody does. Because if someone could say exactly what a ghost is, people couldn't doubt they were real. So I think until we get to that point, there's unanswered questions. And that's what drives me is to find the answers. And until we get to the point where someone says, yep, this is a ghost and this is what it does, I think we need to just keep going and exploring more. And that's where the research comes in. If you go into a building and a psychic says, well, I sense a ghost by the name of Jane in the corner, that might be correct. But you kind of need to go into the research and then see, was there ever a Jane connected with this building? Or if you have a piece of ghost hunting equipment that spits out the word Sam, and you're like, okay, there, a ghost named Sam is here. Well, no, who is Sam and what does it? So I'm always researching and digging deeper and to try to find out what a ghost is. I mean, I've experienced enough weird things that I could say, yeah, I think that was paranormal in nature. But to me, paranormal is, it's just not normal because we haven't found the answers yet. So do you often find yourself the victim of misconceptions on what a paranormal researcher is? I, I, th I think so. I know victim I, isn't the word you like no, either. No, no, I didn't no, like no, it when no, asking no, the question, but no, you know what I mean. Because being very transparent, I think that while ghost reality shows did a lot of good in raising awareness as to what a ghost organization does. I think they have grown to the point where it is so far from reality that it has, it's, I've, I have a very distaste for the ghost reality shows because what they're doing, I get why they're doing it, it's entertaining, mm -hmm. but I, I tell people that if I was ever doing an investigation and I walked into a house and the house told me to get out, I'm leaving and you can have all my equipment and I'm done. I've never had those type of experiences. It's not to say that they don't happen. It's just incredibly rare. And I think these ghost shows are kind of upping the ante for ratings. But what is happening now is real people that are think they have a ghost in their house and it's because they're seeing something, but it's just a ghost sitting in a corner. That's all it's doing. I hear from a lot of people that they are hesitant to reach out to people because they think, well, that's not really a big enough ghost thing. It's just this where I'm like, but that's the real story. That's what I'm trying to get to. I'm trying to strip away all of the, I guess you could say Hollywood The aspects. shark weakification. Yeah, <laughs> there you go, exactly. Yes, yes, I like that. It's yours. <laughs> so. You are interested in the paranormal. You are interested in roadside oddities. You are interested in historical incongruencies. What do you enjoy about the aberrant? Why do you enjoy the strange? 
I think because when it comes right down to it, I don't, I don't want to live in a world where I have all the answers. I think it would be a very boring place. And so I just love the idea that if it's a roadside oddity and I'm just like, that's just weird. What, why did somebody make that? That doesn't make sense. Why did they create that? I want to know what drove them to do that. Or when people see lights up in the sky and they're like, you know, I think it was a UFO. And I'm like, well, I guess it was because it was unidentified flying in an object. But when it gets to the point where they're like, it could be visitors from another planet. I'm like, it could be. And I, I just like the not knowing. I, I always tell people I don't have all the answers and I don't want to have them all because that's what keeps me going. It's learning new things. And I mentioned it in my presentation. I love nothing better than reading about something and saying that can't be real, that can't exist. And then you go around a corner and there it is. And you're like, it does exist. And I've, you've gone your whole life up until that point, not thinking that was real and there it was. Those are the things that I, I absolutely love and live for. And the fact that I can bring my wife and daughter with me to experience it, that's what I'm just like, this is, it's the greatest thing ever, you know, because it's something that we can do as a family. You know, I wasn't gonna bring up the family aspect because I didn't want to bring your personal life into it, but because you did, I would love to follow up on that. How much more fun is it to be able to do these different things with your favorite people? It, it's, it's amazing. It, it's, I mean, it's something that I, I, I don't take lightly, but it's something that I love doing. And we, we've gone so far as that when we go on our, our road trips, we all contribute songs to the playlist and it goes in the car, whatever song comes up, even if it's not one of mine, it has to stay on. So the three of us create our traveling playlist. We go to these different places together. It's, it's amazing. So you mentioned the playlist. I do want to know what your parrot's favorite Queen song is. Um, his favorite song is Khashoggi Ship, which is what he's, uh, he was actually named after. His name is Khashoggi. Yeah, he, he likes uh, Freddie Mercury's voice. <laughs> I don't know why, but he Because does. he has exquisite taste. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't feel like the parrot needs to justify that choice. But, like, if I had a macaw that liked Aretha, I think the, <laughs> I think the macaw is standing on solid ground. Yeah, he was, he was rescued from a Walmart that somebody had returned for store credit. They didn't even sell the birds there, and I, I couldn't get him to interact. And then I was walking around listening to Queen, my favorite group, when I was cleaning and I, he started interacting with me. So he became known as Khashoggi because he was dancing to the song Khashoggi Ship by Queen. Right on. <laughs> what are you writing or researching at the moment? So the one thing that I've done is I've written Southern Ohio Legends and Lore and Central Ohio Legends and Lore. So the, the third one in the series is Northern Ohio Legends and Lore. So that's focusing kind of obviously on the northern part of the state. And that's everything from ghost stories to, it's weird Ohio-esque. It's got some ghost stories, it's got weird roadside oddities, and then it's also just got weird aspects of history that I was really into at the time. I am uh, writing a book on the Loveland Frog, or the Loveland Frog Man, depending who you ask. Um, I've been researching that for about 18, 20 years and finally had the breakthrough as to what everybody was experiencing with that. It's not what they said it was, so. I'll put that out there as a teaser for now. It's, he was not a, a, a giant frog with a magic wand, but I did find where all those aspects came from. They were different things that kind of got pulled in together. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, because um, I'm very used to the Loveland frog being the chapter between like the grass man and the melon heads. Yes. You get eight pages. You say they all smelled swamp gas and you move on. Correct. So I'm looking forward yeah. to di a deeper dig into that. Yeah, it's, it was amazing to find out when you look at what people think of the Loveland frog now is that he is this sort of giant frog with a magic wand. And then to go back and look at all of the sightings that go all the way back through the 1950s, it's not the same creature, but the different aspects of it are pulled through. And so it's kind of like as the story kind of changed over time, different aspects got pulled through. And so the creature itself fell away, but the magic wand stayed and got pulled through until you eventually you end up with that. So 
it's like Santa Claus. It kind of is, in a way, you, but with a magic got the wand. Different, <laughs> you got the different aspects of the legend yes. that eventually amalgamate into a single image with which we're now familiar. Exactly, yep. Um, there is Ohio's Historic Haunts 2, which is the follow-up for, obviously, Ohio's Historic Haunts that I did with um, Kent State University. So that is, uh, right now, they have got there. We've got the 20 locations that are going to be featured in the book, and that is with the board, Kent State University Press's board, to give the final blessing on, and then we're going to hit the ground running with that. And then there is a fourth one, which deals with, I'm going to keep it, vague, but it was a specific year where there were over 1,500 UFO sightings throughout the world, and people were seeing the same sort of creatures coming out of it all around the world, and I have no idea until I just stumbled across it why more hasn't been done with that particular year and what was happening. Not only what was going on in the world in terms of what we were shooting up into space and those sort of things, but also why are these creatures being described the same way being seen in El Salvador and then in Texas? I was gonna ask, was this a space race era thing? Um, not really the race, but there is, basic, there is a race-like component to it that uh -huh. I think um, people were looking up to the skies a lot more. So that one is sort of getting fleshed out and kind of shopped around. But. Okay. You know, you know who's got a doctorate in astronomy. Who? Brian May. Yeah, oh, indeed, yes, <laughs> Doctor May. Doctor yeah. May. Um, <laughs>